Hi! Welcome to the Dairy Hour Podcast, where rural charm meets personal growth. Join us as we milk every moment for wisdom, self-improvement, and mental wellness. I'm your host, Val Levine, a rural dairy farming mom with a passion for filling hearts while never forgetting to fill my own cup. Get ready for insightful conversations, empowering tips, and a splash of fun and laughs, of course. Let's cultivate growth, nourish our minds, and embrace the journey together. This is the Dairy Hour Podcast, where every episode is a breath of fresh air and the inspiration you need to be your best self. Hey, Dairy Hour listeners, this is Val Levine, and I'm thrilled to tell you about an event you won't want to miss. Mark your calendars for the Forward Together National Conference happening in Kansas City from November 5th to the 7th, 2024. This incredible conference hosted by the Dairy Girl Network is the perfect opportunity for dairy women, whether you're on the farm or in the industry, to come together, learn, and recharge. With over 25 dynamic speakers, engaging breakout sessions, and thought-provoking panel discussions, you will leave feeling energized, connected, and armed with new knowledge to succeed in your daily journey. Oh, and I'll be there. I can't wait to connect with all of you. From sustainability to leadership, there's something for everyone. Plus, if you can't make it to Kansas City, don't worry. You can join us virtually from anywhere with their interactive on-demand option. Join us for three days of networking, learning, and a whole lot of fun. Registration is now open and it's time to book your travel for the best price. Head to dairygirlnetwork.com to learn more and register. Registration will close in early October. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's episode of the Dairy Hour podcast. I am your host, Val Levine, and I am joined by a pretty famous lady here, Carrie Mess, also known as the one and only Dairy Carrie. Carrie, how are you today? Hey, I'm pretty good. Good. I am so excited to sit down and chat with you today. And like we were talking about earlier, it's funny because we keep finding these random connections in our life, even though you know, we're states apart, you being in Wisconsin and me being in New York, but we definitely seem to live semi-parallel lives. I've come to discover as you have as well. Uh, So it's just entertaining, but I'm really excited to have a chance to sit down and chat with you and find out what you've been up to and that kind of fun stuff. So if you want to start by telling us a little bit about you. Yeah, sure. So farm with my husband, Uh, we have a dairy farm, just a hundred cows, 300 acres, but I didn't grow up on a farm. I grew up in the city. I had uh, no real connection to farming. I, I joke that my big connection to farming was that I actually lived right off the road that World Dairy Expo is on. <laughs> that, that that was it. So, you know, I'd, every October I'd see all these trailers coming in and we would do our fourth grade field trip to World Dairy Expo. But that was basically my only connection. Like I had a great aunt and, and she still has like cows and calves, uh, beef cattle, but not really it. Um, I was a horse girl growing up and that was a joke that horses were the gateway drug to the rest of agriculture for me. I I just never, I've always loved animals, but I never had had a plan of farming. So fast forward, I meet the son of dairy farmers, but he's not the kid coming back to the farm. Uh, He has a job, service technician, makes good money. Like we had a house in town, eventually bought a house out in the country, not far from where he grew up. And uh, long story short, we're farming. I have been, we've kind of alternated over the years about if I was the main person on the farm and he had a town job or things switched around once the dairy carry thing took off. Um, I started that blog as just a way to share what I was learning about farming and, um, it was kind of back in the early days of online advocacy and uh, it just When grew. did you start Dairy Carry? Great question. Uh, now that you now that you say that, I'm not sure. Well, it's going to be our 16th wedding anniversary this next week. So I think maybe Dairy Carry is 15 years old. Wow, that's impressive. That's definitely quite a lifeline for, you know, something like for a brand like that. Yeah. to still be relevant and that's I'm great. not sure if it's still relevant honestly you're always relevant <laughs> Carrie I am a happy has-been no you're, like well you're like I, the OG though I may be the OG but I am thrilled to not be in the thick of it anymore you know I think some people would say well you know you got eclipsed by all these people 
but literally, I think the first time I met you, I was speaking at a conference, encouraging other people to share about farming. Like that was my whole thing. I didn't want to be the only voice. I wanted other people to talk. And when I first started, like I knew every single farmer that was doing advocacy, right? Like mm -hmm. it was a small group. Yeah. And now I don't even, I couldn't even There's tell you so how certain platforms, like no idea. So I think that was a great success that I encouraged a lot of people to do that. Not that I'm the only one who did, but, and now I don't have to, I can focus on what I want to do and talk more about food and some of the stories in agriculture, but the summer I have actually just kind of completely taken off of social media and it's been great for me. Good. Sometimes you need a break and I think that's okay to acknowledge that you are in a different chapter in your life and want to do something different because it's not like it won't be there if you want to go back to sharing. It's not like it's not, like it's not going to be there. I don't think we're getting right. rid of social media and blogs and all that stuff anytime soon. So you should okay. be pretty secure in that. So you can do whichever, yeah. whatever you want to do. Exactly. And it's okay to listen to our bodies, right? We're talking about that today. And when yeah. something isn't bringing us what it needs to, to reevaluate, take a break and maybe change paths or just take a detour for a while. Yes. Well, I like that. A detour. Yeah. It's just not even a different chapter. It's just a little detour in there. So that's My good. whole life is nothing but side quests, being honest. So um, I know no other way. That's again, something that I think we both have in common because I kind of like see different things and then I'm like, oh, could I do hmm. that? Like just how I ended up with a podcast. One day I was like, <laughs> you know, I really think I want a podcast. Yeah. And everyone's like, well, do you know how to have a podcast? And I was like, no. And they're like, but I'll well, figure it out. Well, I'm going to Google it, of course. Why? <laughs> what else would you do? Right. But you would Google how to start a podcast okay. and maybe talk to a person or two that has a podcast and then just launch do a it. podcast and right. figure it out as you go. For That's sure. kind of, I like that trial and error kind of thing. I mean, I don't think that you learn a lot if you just start doing something and you're automatically perfect at it. I enjoy the challenges of figuring it out. So. One other thing I think we have in common in this like overlaps is I have a real need to have a creative outlet in my life. So whether that's cooking, Moonlight is a private chef, and I also manage a food truck just like you, that's kind of my like creative outlet because the farming is a lot of routine, a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. There's not a ton of room for creativity directly on the farm, right? Yeah. Uh, or at least it wasn't some blogging, cooking. I'm going to pause you there. Creative outlets on the farm. They cost money is what something that we do not have as dairy farmers. So you don't get to have that creative outlet. It's shut down by funds. Yes. We have to find, all the time. We have to find creative outlets that make money instead of spend money. <laughs> exactly. And then they turn into not very fun things anymore because they're whole other jobs. But, but so that creative outlet thing has always been really important to me. And um, that's why I've always kind of had something else other than just like milk and cows, whether that be the blogging or, or food mm -hmm. or whatever. So, uh, yeah, totally lost where we were going with this yes. conversation, okay. but creative outlets are good. There, it's a side point. quest. Side quest, yes. Side quest. Not a side track, a side quest. We're on a yes, quest yes. to do something. The Barnyard Language Podcast is honest talk about running farms and raising families. Hosted by us, Katie and Arlene, an Iowa sheep farmer and an Ontario dairy farmer with six kids, two husbands, and a whole lot of chaos between us. We talk to guests who have life experience that's relatable to parents in agriculture and offer resources, perspective, compassion, a few swears, and lots of laughs. Whether your farm is a raised bed in your backyard or 10,000 acres. Whether your family is in the planning stages or you've got a dozen kids. If you've ever had a car seat in a combine, a stroller in a stable, or you have a toddler or a teen in your tractor, this is the podcast for you. Subscribe to Barnyard Language today on your favorite podcast platform. So yeah, and that was what looped me back there. So I've always had side quests because I've always looked for ways to be creative and do things. I love it. So do you want to talk a little bit about your recent transition because you went from being like the main person on the farm and now you're not, like you said, you and your husband have kind of flipped back and forth mm -hmm. over the past time that you've been on the farm. 
So yeah. do you want to talk about your recent, like, you know, what made you be, you know, what made you and your husband flip flop basically out of that? Well, so originally I was the main person on the farm and he kept the job in town. Remember that good paying job we talked about? Yeah. <laughs> That was nice. Well, listen, but you know, families are hard. Family dynamics on farms can be hard. Once the dairy carry thing took off and I started doing more and more speaking and traveling for that, um, we needed to to have someone else be the full-time person on the farm. Um, so my husband left his job in town, came back and um, I love my husband to death. He's the best. We cannot work well together. We just, we are so opinionated and headstrong and want everything our way and want to be the, the boss. And so, you know, we've always kind of done a divide and conquer thing on the farm so that we stay out of each other's hair, but we're also only a hundred cows. So there's only so much hair to stay out of or space to stay out of each other's hair. Um, And it worked for a long time. And then again, you know, families are hard. Sometimes working together can be hard. And it just became a better idea for me to step back a little bit more. Um, and then slowly, like, I just was starting to kind of lose energy and lose, like, fire. Yeah. And not just the fire, but. I don't want to say I didn't care anymore because I did, but there was something like something changed where I just was very blah about all mm -hmm. of it. And, you know, I went to my doctor and we talked about depression, but I didn't, I didn't feel like it was depression. I just, it was a, a change. And I was like, gosh, this is weird. Um, it was the start of many doctor's appointments trying to figure things out. Cause there, there was, just weird things going on in my body and I just kept attributing them to anything and everything else but there being something actually wrong uh, and then uh eventually we figured out there was something wrong this so this is a lesson to everybody yes that when you know something's wrong deep down inside you need to figure out what is wrong don't just brush it off that's your little disclaimer so right, go ahead right. Carrie so I'm blessed with probably one of the very best doctors I could ever have as a primary care physician. He's our family doctor. He takes care of my kids, my in-laws, my husband, myself, all of us, and he cares, right? Mm -hmm. So, oh, about a year and a half ago, I showed up in his office again and I, you know, we'd, we'd done the test to figure out why I was so tired all the time and nothing really came up. And it's like, well, you got a lot on your plate, Carrie, you know, you think maybe that's just that. I'm like, you know, maybe, I don't know, I guess. But then the one day I uh, had dropped my car off for an oil change and walked over to the bank to like throw some checks in or something. And it's only like a three block walk in town. Um, and halfway to the bank, my legs started shaking, like the muscles, my quads were shaking like uncontrollably and it was the weirdest thing in the world it's early spring and I, I'm just like this is weird so I you know go back in to see my doctor again and he's like you have really low vitamin d like really low so we're gonna put you on really high dose and but it's gonna take a while and that's probably why you've been so tired and we're gonna do this and it'll be good and I was like cool and so I did the high dose of vitamin D and, you know, summer was coming. So I started getting real vitamin D outside and, um, and I was feeling better. I mean, I, I didn't have the shakes anymore. Um, and I was still tired a lot, but oh, I was better. And so I kept just kept my head down, kept doing, kept doing, kept doing, um, you know, I'm a mom, farmer, businesses, like all the things. And so finally fall rolls around and my kids, my lovely little germy children bring home some sort of cough. Um, you know what? Actually, even before that, in August, the one day I bent down to pick a cherry tomato up out of my garden and I felt like somebody hit me in the back of the head with a sledgehammer. It was horrible. 
And so I did it again. I'm like, what is this? Like I bent down again and it did it again. And I was like, I need a new pillow. Clearly. <laughs> that must be it. Clearly I slept wrong last night. I need to get a new pillow and maybe our mattress needs to be replaced. It's not that old. We got it cheap and it's kind of shady. So it's probably broke down. And, um, and I'd get these like really intense headaches that only lasted for a short amount of time. And then, so I ignored them again. They, they hurt big time, but I, I was convinced I needed a new pillow. I did not order myself a new pillow, but I was pretty sure that's what was wrong. And... That's a fun thing to do if I've ever heard one. Man, right. I think I need a new pillow and a new mattress, but right. it's fine. Not... We're just going to go with it. Right. These headaches only last like 30 seconds. They're the worst headache I've ever had in my life, but it's 30 seconds. So what's the big deal? So then the boys brought home some sort of plague and it was a coughing thing. And I got this cough that it was just uncontrollable. And the headache happened every time I coughed. Ew. Uh, yeah. Real bad. Because I was constantly coughing. And uh, I went to the, my doctor again. I'm like, I can't get rid of this cough. And I get this headache. And he's like, hmm, maybe we need to think about it like an MRI, this whole headache thing. And I was like, oh, why? <laughs> but why? <laughs> I think I need a new pillow. <laughs> and he's like, I'm going to submit an MRI to your insurance to get, you know, pre-approval. And I was like, eh, whatever. Okay. <laughs> sure. Yes. It's fine. And by Halloween, the pre-approval, of course, was taking forever. By Halloween, the cough was so bad. I couldn't control the cough. The headaches oh. were so bad. I drove myself. <laughs> Another to the emergency too. room. Yep. Yes. I went to the good emergency room, which was further away than the less good emergency You know room. you're in a rural town when you go to the good emergency room, not just the shady one. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So I went all the way into Madison, went to the UW, pulled up in their ER, and I was like, listen, there is something wrong. And the the PA that came in, this woman was great. Um, She's like, I think I know what's up. And you're getting an MRI right now. And I was like, it's my pillow. Just help me quit coughing, you guys. Like, my neck is just really sore. Just give me some cough syrup and call it good. Let's go. Right. Now, let me tell you, prior to this, like a couple weeks prior to this, my balance has always been bad. I'm a klutz, right? Like, this is what I've told myself my whole life. Um, A couple weeks prior to this, I was putting a big tray of food in the commercial oven in the kitchen, and I fell into the oven. Ah. because my balance was so bad um and like I burned my arm and everything because I just I kind of just tipped forward but I'm a klutz right yeah so you brushed yeah. it off yeah so I brushed it off and I'm like Jesus I'll be a little more careful next time right yeah like why why stand on your feet woman like your feet are big enough to hold you up this should not be an issue so I had all these things and I just kept ignoring them and it ended up in the ER. They did an MRI and the PA comes back and she goes, so here's the deal. You have something called Chiari malformation. And I had Googled my symptoms and these weird headaches. And that was something that came up and I read the symptoms and I was like, no, not it. Something so else. You're one of those people that didn't think you were going to die when you Google symptoms because I am. Oh, a, no. oh, I don't Google symptoms because I'm like, oh my gosh this is it. Yeah. I've got two days to live. Like, it's, yeah, it's just going to be. No, boring. I'm the opposite. I'm like, okay. nah, it's fine. It's my pillow. My poor pillow. I, I did eventually order another pillow, by the way, through this Perfect. process. Doing help. You deserved it after this. <laughs> yeah. Um, she's got, so you've got this thing called Chiari malformation and basically, um, the bottom of your brain is trying to like poke through your skull where it shouldn't. And it's putting pressure on your brain stem and you're going to need brain surgery. And I went, um, are you sure this is the right person? Yeah. Like, oh my God. Okay. And, uh, but what happened was, is she left and the doctor came in. Cause again, UW is a teaching hospital. So mm -hmm. I don't know like at what level she was in the schooling, but like the boss doctor came in and he was like, yeah, you're going to have to go to a headache clinic for this. So you're not going to need surgery, but you're going to have to really be careful about pain medicine management. 
And I'm like, what? What? And I'm like, this is very different from what the PA just told me. And he's like, yeah, well, she's wrong. They're going to do this. Thankfully, the PA went ahead and ordered a urgent consult with neurosurgery. Um, so that was, I think it was Halloween day that I was in the ER, or right around there. Um, long story short, December 5th, I had uh, brain surgery. Uh, they took out part of my skull, then did not put it back. Everybody's like, oh, so they put it back? No. Nope, they just took out part of my skull. Didn't need that anymore. Needed more <gasps> room for my big ass brain. And then they um, shaved down my top vertebrae uh, again to create more room and then sewed a patch into the dura, which is the lining around your brain again to oh. create room. So basically this is something that I was born with. Um, it probably got worse as I got older, but, um, yeah, my, my brain was pushing onto my brain stem. Um, uh, the brain was like herniated through the, the base of my skull, like eight millimeters a lot, and a lot all... when you're talking about your brain movement. Yes. Right. Like brains shouldn't herniate. It's a really good rule. Actually. Don't let your brain herniate. I mean, uh, Yeah. If Put anyone's ever even heard of that before. Rules for your body. And so I had this brain surgery. Uh, so many of my symptoms, balance issues, the headaches, the exhaustion, this just constant blah feeling all tied back to that. And when I look back like over my whole life, when I was a kid, I remember I would used to like turn my head and get like a shocking sharp pain that would run up my neck. And um, that that's what it was. And I, I remember I told my parents about it as a kid and they were just growing like, pains. You're fine. Walk it off. Yep. And I wonder how I got to be so good at ignoring my own body symptoms. It was like you were raised to be a farmer. Like that's right. just, that's how I, that goes. I think it's just that um, I'm an elder millennial Oregon Trail generation latchkey kid and I played outside till dark and drank from a hose and that's just how it was um so yeah it turns out that so much of what was going on was because of that so had surgery December 5th um I liberated myself from the hospital 36 hours later because I was mad <laughs> about being in there and they wouldn't leave me alone um, came home and had a pretty pretty intense recovery like you know it just it, that's not something you bounce back from really fast I mean yeah brain surgery isn't like you know a day in procedure where you're like good yeah. in a couple of days no I right. wouldn't think that operating on your brain or you're taking part of your skull out is very uh yeah you'll be fine in three days it's fine right right exactly but within two weeks, I was feeling so much better, right? Like, I was like, holy cow, I'm really doing good. And then the back of my head started swelling. I ended up having syrinx, a fluid-filled sac, yeah. um, develop. And I tried to get in to see the surgeon, and they wouldn't see me, wouldn't see me, wouldn't answer my calls. So one day, I just drove over there and sat in their office until they saw me. Um, and her response was to teach me how to wrap my head as tight as could be in an ace bandage, which is not actually a feasible thing in any, in any way. So um, for several weeks, the syrinx just sat there and continued to put pressure on my brain stem again. It was like, I was right back to where I was. Um, and the neurosurgeon didn't want to do anything about it. My family doctor was trying to help me figure it out, but like, there's yeah. only so much they can do though right and he's not a neurosurgeon um yeah. he's amazing but he's he has his limitations and he knows them thankfully yes um and so you know we scheduled another mri to see if it was a, a leak if i was you know not just a syrinx but um thankfully like after a month of this huge lump in the back of my head and pushing on my brain again um one day I like turned my head and I felt something weird and the syrinx started to drain um, internally, not externally. So oh. I don't know where that fluid went, but it went away. So that's cool. And um, so from that point, then I finally felt like I really started to heal and I felt so much better than I did before surgery. 
Um, and I was like, all right, cool, we're good. And then a few months ago, I was like, there's still something not right. Um, and this is something I haven't actually talked about very much at all. Actually, I haven't I haven't talked about it at all publicly or even privately on Facebook or anything. There's stuff that wasn't quite right. I was losing hair, losing weight. Um, went back to being just exhausted all the time. Don't I don't want to eat like which me not wanting to eat. There's something wrong. Yes, I'm the same way on that. Babe. And so I've been working to figure out um, what's going on there. Again, ended up having to see a specialist. That ended up being like the worst doctor's appointment of my life. But I have uh, like a bunch of my hormone levels are off. So something's wrong with my pituitary gland or, or something. We're not sure. I'm in the process of figuring that out. But um, again, I know there's something wrong. I'm listening to my body. Mm -hmm. And when I went to the endocrinologist and they said, no, there's nothing wrong, despite, you know, multiple blood tests showing there's something wrong. Yeah. I was able to look at him in the eye and say, no, I'm advocating for myself. Yeah. There is something wrong. And you are going to help me get to the bottom of it. Because I've I've ignored my body for so long. Yeah. And I'm going to do that again. And I told him that and he kind of brushed me off. But he did order a few more tests. So we're going to keep working on this and figure it out but um as good as I was at advocating for agriculture advocating for myself in medical situations didn't happen yeah it's a whole different ball game too right I'm changing that I'm not gonna do that anymore I'm not gonna just be like walk it off you're fine don't be a drama queen all these internal things I tell myself and I told myself for years yeah Till till got to the point of being so bad that you know you I felt literally like brought you to your knees and it literally brought me to my knees. Yes. Yeah. So I'm not gonna do that anymore. And I really hope that the people who are listening to this stop doing that too. Farmers, right? Like that's the joke that if a farmer takes himself to the ER, they're about dead. Um and it shouldn't be like that. It shouldn't be like that. No. Um, especially women, you know, we ignore that our cycles are weird or something's off and and we just say you know this is just what it is right um and then you find out later oh well I have uterine cancer or something like that because Mm -hmm. and it it's now at stage two or three or four heaven forbid yeah and if we would have just not ignored the symptoms earlier our story would be very different so I'm really trying to remind people, like, when your check engine light is on. Don't keep driving. Don't keep driving. It's like I have a um, a sticker on our barn fridge with the check engine light, and it says, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Oh, don't do that. Yeah, don't do that. Don't take advice from the little sticker. Right. I mean, in general, it's a bad idea, but that's, that's where we're at. I, I just... We have to stop doing that. And I know, especially with those of us who are Mm self-employed. So I think the one thing I wish people would learn from my experience um, is that they have to listen to what their body is telling them. Go to the doctor. I know it's hard with insurance and it costs money and it's not cheap, but my quality of life, I, I don't know how many years I wasted feeling horrible um that I could have not gone with if I would have just pushed in the in the first place so yeah money is real but so is your life right living your life like a zombie because you just have nothing in the tank anymore um or you know you're you're battling physical ailments, pains, things like that, that keep you from living. Like that's not worth not going to see someone and figure it out. And, and finding a good doctor that listens, super important Mm -hmm. too. Yeah, definitely. And I feel like if there's, you know, if you can pick up anything from your journey is, you know, keep going until you find someone also that's going to advocate for you. 
-hmm. as hard as you're going to advocate for yourself because there are, you know, I had some minor issues in my lungs that we found when I had pneumonia and the pulmonologist that I got sent to was terrible. Like he had no bedside manner. I couldn't understand what he was trying to tell me. Then when he did finally tell me what was wrong, it was more like a, oh my God, this is super rare. It's super scary. Like you might have a stroke and die and like all this stuff. And I'm like, what? So when I found the right doctor and I went to him and he's like, you're not going to just drop dead. You've gone 30 some odd years with this disorder. It's not a like, you're fine. Obviously, if you have signs of a stroke or something like, go, you should go do something hospital. about that. <laughs> yes. He's like, but it just, you know knowing about it is not going to change how you live your daily life. So that's so important. And just, he gave me so much more comfort knowing that like, just because now we know this is an issue, like it doesn't mean, oh my gosh, your time's up. You're going to have a stroke. You're going to die. Like it's not going to be good. So I think just finding someone that has that way to explain it to you where it's comforting, like, yes, they might not be delivering the best news. It might still not be the news that you want, but finding someone that can explain it to you in a way that's comforting where you understand what's going on with your body and someone that's not going to stop until you're fixed. That is the key to this too. So I do, I do love that you talked about advocating for yourself and, you know, don't stop until you get those answers. If you know that something's wrong within your body, you need to keep pushing until you find the answer because someone out there will help you find the answer. You just need to find those people. So Sure. That's my soapbox. I'm on it with you. I love it. So Carrie, I love your journey. So you're working in a food truck a little bit now. You're not full-time on the farm anymore. You're just kind of, you know, abiding your time, keeping everybody in the household happy, living, yeah. living life. So that is good. Yeah. I'm still a private chef to at Babcock House at Madison on, on campus in Madison. But um, in the summer, the students go home and I decided, hey, let's manage a food truck. That'll be fun. Ignoring completely that um, food truck season also overlaps with the school year. Mm -hmm. And also, it's a little busy on the farm, September, October. Like, there's a few things going on. Just a couple. Uh, It's it's no big deal. It'll be fine. That's tomorrow Carrie's problem, not today Carrie's problem. So It'll all work out the way it's It'll be fine. It'll be fine. Yep. I know exactly what you mean by that. hundred percent agree. So Carrie, I love at this point in the episode to just ask a few rapid fire questions just for fun, just to get to know you a little bit better. Yeah. So with that, what's your go-to cats or dogs? Uh, Dogs. 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 Definitely dogs. She says. Um, We have two cats in our house that completely nor my exists. They're in this house because of me. You know, they're <laughs> cute little kittens that I saved and they ignore me and only care about my husband. So dogs. I choose dogs, you little you yeah. little jerks. How dare you? Right, exactly. You'd be nothing if it weren't for me. That's what you gotta <laughs> tell them. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Uh what's your go-to hype song? Like if you've got to get pumped up oh. for something. Gosh, probably fat bottom girls make the rock and roll go round. I love it. That's amazing. (laughs) I'm a classic rock girl. Oh my gosh. That's so funny. So when I think of hype song and I mean, I guess, well, I like a good like thousands rap song just because that's the generation that I am from. Like regulate. Yes. But when I was a kid, one of my best friends in high school was like star sports player in the school. Mm -hmm. And Eye of the Tiger was her go-to. <laughs> so now whenever I hear Eye of the Tiger, I revert back to high school and my friend's warming up for a basketball game. I love <laughs> and it. I'm just like, okay. I mean, it hypes me up too, but you know, I don't right. know if it's what I use. But when I hear hype song, that's what I immediately go to. <laughs> I don't know why. Oh. Favorite food to cook? Oh, probably pastas. I love, I love pasta. So I like pasta. If too. I say pasta, like that covers a lot of different foods. So, but a good pasta. Yeah. Good pasta. Not just pasta, but a good pasta. Right. Yes. I mean, if I make uh, it, it's obviously good. <laughs> duh. <laughs> duh. And I am opposite. I just prefer someone else to make it for me. And then I'm like, yep, this is excellent because I didn't have to do it. <laughs> I also like that. <laughs> yes. 
there's so everyone's like oh my gosh you have catering business you have food trucks like you must be such a good cook and I'm like actually I don't really cook that often no my husband is my husband is like a phenomenal chef like he is so good and my mom is really good as well so I am the organizer the front person the pretty face in the window I mean I can like in the food truck and stuff don't get me wrong like I can cook I just choose not you're not doing the recipe development no I can follow a recipe problem the problem with my husband and my mom is that they don't follow recipes so there are no recipes so if I need to cook on vibes man it's just vibes yeah so anyways, that's how that rolls. I am very by the book type A, like need to know, like I can bake because I can follow an exact recipe. Yeah, I don't. Bake. I cannot cook because I can't just throw a little bit of this and a little bit of that and make it taste good. And I'm like, oh, no, can't do that. One of the, the hardest things about me, sharing like, oh, blog, no. like recipes on my blog is that I have to like pay attention to how much I'm adding and write it down as I'm going so that I can be like, yeah. this is how I made this. And um, Yeah. That's, do you write the six page story before the recipe on your blog or are you the cool blog that puts the recipe at the top I mean so <laughs> I don't want to trust me I'd love to just stick the recipe in there but for so long Google was like listen you have to have it be so many words in order for it to even rank in Google and then finally it was like okay actually you have to write those many words, but it also has to pertain to the recipe and not like your grandma's life story. And now Google is like throwing a fit and the whole food blogger community is like in a collapsing spiral. So I don't know what Google's going to do. I write down recipes and share them if they're yummy and kind of just let it happen from there. That works. I mean, letting it happen, that works. Um, yeah. And let's see. What is your, ooh, sorry, I'm struggling to pick which one I want to ask you. What is your, like, okay, what's your favorite food to not cook, but to, like, go out and get? Oh, I don't know. I, I'm really trying to learn, like, more international cuisine, so, mm-hmm. um, I went to an Indian buffet the other day and got to try some different stuff and honestly it sucked, but I'm going to go to a different one. That's going to be much better. Um, so Perfect. that's, that's my thing right now. Just trying uh, new cultures, foods, learning it. I want to try all the things. Cool. Do all the different things, all the national, all yeah. the different national. Oh my gosh. I can't talk. Nationality. There we yeah. go. It's coming. Yes, yes. Dear. So I also, at the end of the episode, like to ask a, like a deeper thought question that was left by a previous guest. And this is all completely random. So what does being happy mean to you? And what does that look like in your daily life? And I feel like this one kind of hits home for you because I know that it's a constant journey. I knew I could get you with this one. Yeah, that's a good one. So I think being happy for me is having a day where I don't feel like I'm not doing everything I need to do or meeting expectations. Happy is a day where I'm not yelling at my kids to, oops, speaking of dogs, it's, oh gosh, I don't know. It's just a, it's a feeling inside of me that, that I am not always sure how to get to figuring it out more and more what's taking me away from that feeling. So I'm scaling down, I'm paring back, and this is good. Good. That's a, I think that's a great answer. And with that, what is your quote or, you know, motivational inspiration? What so drives I, you to the best carry you can be? I have the four main words of the cadet maxim tattooed on my forearm. And the cadet maxim is risk more than others think is safe, care more than others think is wise, dream more than others think is practical, and expect more than others think is possible. So those are my words. Awesome. I love it. Carrie, where can people find you if they do want to check out your blog, check out your recipes and all that fun stuff? I'm hiding under a rock. No, I'm kidding. Online, you can find me as Dairy Carrie on most of the platforms. Um, and my blog is dairycarry.com. It's 
C A R R I E, the right way. Awesome. And I, will, yes, the correct name way to spell Carrie. Right. And I will link that in the show notes for those of you that are interested in checking out Dairy Carrie's new adventures of cooking. And Carrie, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to come on with us today. I hope that you have all learned a ton from listening to Carrie. And I hope that you learn to listen to your body and do what your body needs instead of just ignoring it and brushing it under a rock. And hope that everyone that listening to this can do it the easy way instead of learning the hard way like some people do. So listen to your body. Awesome. Any parting words, Carrie? Have a great day, guys. Make it the best you can. Awesome. Learn to say no. That's my other thing. That too. (laughs) Yeah. That's a whole nother episode right there. I love it. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for joining us today on the Dairy Hour podcast. Please share this with a friend. Share it to your socials. Tag me, Dairy Gal Val. Tag Dairy Carrie. She might not reshare because she's on hiatus, but that's okay. We appreciate it. Any share, comment, uh, you know, review anything like that does help small podcasts like this grow. So thank you so much. And we will talk to you next week. Have a story to share or wisdom to impart? Be a guest on the Dairy Hour podcast with me, Val Levine. We are seeking passionate individuals from all walks of life for insightful conversations and empowering tips from mindset to motherhood to nutrition and fitness. We cover all of the essentials to be your best self. Share your journey and inspire others. Reach out today to be a guest on the Dairy Hour podcast, where your voice can make a difference. For more information, visit dairygalval.com or email at dairygalval at icloud.com.